Church, my name is Shiloh. It is a joy to welcome you this third Sunday at Easter and Easter Tide season where we get to sing the hallelujah again and we get to live in the joy and the light of the season. And the whole book means not just me. Am I blessed to have the church here today? Would you mind if you're in the pew taking that blue binder that's there and sign in? Pass it down and let all of those who are sitting next to you get a chance to sign in. If you're worshiping with us online, we'd love to know you're here. If you'll just leave us a comment or even subscribe to our channel. Subscribe it helps us uh, let you know when we go live on Sunday mornings or for other events. Today, as we um, respond to God's grace with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, our vows to be the people that we have become in our baptism, I hope that you will connect deeply with one another in the word that's both read and preached. This church cares deeply about your life, what you're going through, celebrating the joys and those milestones of life so that you're not there alone, and also standing with you in the depths of grief and, and disappointment and, and illness. And, and so when we ask for you to share your prayers with us, we want you to know we, we care about you. And this is one of the ways you can let us know it's very hard to show up at hospital or if we don't know you're there, but, but when we do know, we want to be there and be present with you in it. And so there are prayer cards in the blue binder. You could email us, call the front office. Facebook us, even, I'm like, you could send a sub or a or how you communicate. Well, we want you to communicate your, uh, how we can do the church together with you. And as we stand and sing this morning, may you find the joy of your own soul. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please stand and join me in singing number 318, Christ is Alive. Please join me for the prayer of illumination written on the screens. O God of endurance, by the power of your Holy Spirit, restore our stride with you, that in these words of scripture and sermon, 
we may freely run for Christ, whose name we pray. Amen. Listen as God speaks to us through the appointed reading from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from those among those who have gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cried, and the Lord, uh, to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing, and you have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Thus ends the first reading. As the children come forward, would you join us in singing this first verse? We have to do all kinds of things 
to practice running. <coughs> like, do you have a favorite pair of shoes you like to run in? Ooh, I like these. These are good. Oh, do you like running in those shoes? Yeah. Um, and and you said you have a favorite place to run, but we're going to talk about that. Do you have something's favorite clothes you like to run? I invite you to listen now as God speaks to us today, as he did to the church at Corinth through the appointed reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Do you, know, do you not know that in a race all runners compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that I, after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
a race, you run through the tape. If you want to cross the finish line, you don't stop before you get there. You're running to the 10 feet behind it. And in this series, we ask, have we lived in such a way that we are not afraid to die, but to run through the greatest finish line, the last finish line? And what does it mean to approach our lives and the end of our lives from a Christian perspective? When John Wesley crossed the last finish line, his final words were, in the best of all, God is with us. In this series we begin today, I invite you to both the light of Easter hope and the resurrection gift that brings about eternity. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we gather in this place today and we pray that we, as we offer you our lives, our bodies, our spirits, our emotions again, that you would write this scripture on our lives and that we would experience what it is to run with you the race you have set before us and help us oh god to have ears to hear you feet that would move for you a heart that is open to something that might even cause us fear that we would find ourselves faithful to the extraordinary season of easter it's in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. On Sunday, April the 28th, runners will gather at the starting line for the 24th annual Oklahoma City Memorial Marathon. Hear these words from their official race website. The Run to Remember brings together runners and spectators from around the world to honor those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. Each race begins with 168 seconds of silence in honor of those who were killed. And along the course, Runners will go by the banners of 168 people who were the victims in that bombing. It looks like this. I've known people who run this race once and some who run it every year. They run by these banners and see the faces of those who died too young. And over the years, I've known runners who did this run in honor, they competed, first of all, which is different than just like completing. They competed in this race, um, one specifically who ran in honor of her aunt, who was the last survivor to come from the rubble. After that, it became a recovery effort. And I think about the Lawton United Methodist Church small group, they're called the Circuit Runners. I like a good, like... Methodist joke. <laughs> Their small group is running. Now that may not be your small group, but if you want a running small group, those are, cap those are possible. They get together and run, and they trained for over a year because they wanted to run in honor of someone that they love. They wanted to be prepared. They wanted to run the race. No one made them run. There was no bear chasing them. There was no pile of money they were running to. They wanted to run. And they didn't just want to run. They wanted to cross the finish line. And we talk about in this series, the last finish line. Today about how we train to finish well. We're training you and I for a race that matters more than any other. And yes, we are reaching for the tape that marks the end of this life as we lean into what awaits us after we die. And I imagine a victory lap after that. 
The Apostle Paul writes the letter that Peter read for us today, and he writes it to guide us in our training. He chooses to talk to those people that he loves with a metaphor that would be really familiar to the hearers in Corinth. See, Corinth was one of the sites of the Ismethian Games, one of the four Pan-Hellenic Games, mainly athletic competitions, but some kind of others, held in the ancient world every other year. And Paul's audience then, and maybe us now, would be familiar with the traditions surrounding those games. He sort of ticks them off in the scripture reading, right? First of all, there's the cultic practices of worship, right? They seek favor from their gods so they can improve their performance. They also note that there is honor in competing, not just for themselves, but as a representation of their family name, or maybe even the hometown that they're from. They understand the necessity of training if you are to compete at a high level. And finally in the scripture they notice and put us on notice that you have to always be aware of being disqualified. Which frankly in the Roman world would have been far worse than just losing. Because then you never would have known if you could have won. Paul puts us hearers through the paces with a familiar example to help correct a misunderstanding about what a life of faith in Jesus looks like for those of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord. The problem is they thought they had gained some sort of superior status somehow bested the rest who had not yet come to believe. Leading up to what we read today in chapter 9, Paul has an argument where he tries to help us understand that progressing in our spiritual life along the way is never a reason to boast. Never. He reaches the height of his correction in verse 23, where he says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I might become a partner in it. That's the finish line, my friends. Becoming a partner in the gospel. When every effort that we make, all of the training that we do to become people of faith, all of this is for one purpose that we might partner in the gospel. It's not a self-improvement plan. Then as Paul comes toward the scripture we read today, he introduces an image of runners running a race. It kind of morphs into fighting a fight. But we're going to stick with the race for the moment because the point is he's racing to win. To cross the finish line, to grab the prize, to be reminded that competitors have to work and work hard to win a wreath. And a perishable one at that, a prize that doesn't even last. And that causes me to wonder why he chooses an example of a prize that withers. Why does he do that? I mean, on one hand, I can imagine the wreath. Maybe you can too, right? It's a circlet of leaves, and they place it upon the champion's head to show their accomplishment of crossing the finish line. Corinthians uh, would have understood that they had worked hard for that win, that they had become the best because they had worked hard. But you know, the leaf, the wreath, it was, it was celery leaves. It began to wilt like the second you put it on their head. (laughs) By that sun beating down and the steamy sweat pouring off, like literally the wreath falls off of you at some point. It withers and falls off because there's nothing left to it. That's the kind of wreath he's talking about. On the other hand, um, we don't really want to work that hard, pour our dedication and our determination 
and our focus into something that ultimately doesn't matter. Like celery doesn't even have calories, you guys. <laughs> Paul says it's about perspective. It's all about perspective. Paul reminds us as his hearers that the wreath that is waiting for us at the last finish line will never perish He indicates to us, uh, when he says this a little later in chapter 15, these words will sound familiar to you when he wrote, this perishable body will put on imperishability. This mortal body puts on immortality. And when the saying that is written will be fulfilled, death has been swallowed up in victory. Paul is talking about the last finish line, the marker between this life and the next. And Paul wants us to be clear that this finish line, this one that is between life and what is to come, we are to run it to win. Furthermore, Paul reminds us that we have to train for that race if we have any reason to expect having even a shot at winning the prize. So how do we train for the most important race? One way to think about training is to take the long view. For instance, um, I don't, I'm looking across the room. I'm not sure if I have any current runners. I know I have at least one cross-country runner who wishes never, ever to do that again. And maybe, uh, but maybe I have some of you who are, have been in the past. Runners have a way of competing against themselves. And it starts in the mind. Right? It starts with, I'm going to do better than I did last time. It starts the moment you start lacing up your shoes. You're thinking about where you're running, how far you're running, how fast you ran last time. Can you beat your own time? Competitors at the Oklahoma City Marathon will not try to run their fastest mile on mile one. They will not come out of the gate hot because they know they've got 25 miles ahead of them. 25 miles to go. And they also know this, the last mile is just as important as the first. So often... We think about smaller things being the finish line. Like, if you're in school, you think of like high school graduation as your finish line. You're trying to get to the finish line. Or maybe college graduation or your doctoral dissertation. Turn it in already. And maybe you think about other sort of things along the way. For those of us who are a little older in the workforce, maybe like the promotion that you want, the income jump that you need you think about these or that's the finish line or maybe it's buying a house along the way and buying a house is obviously different than paying for said house which is problematic but see these are milestones along the way and you need in a race milestones you need these little like for the next 10 light poles i'm going to run just a little faster i'm going to push my pace for just the next 10, you need these milestones to tell you to speed up or to slow down or to help make sure you're not drifting. But milestones are not the finish line. That's not our finish line. Our finish line is hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's our finish line. And it's faithful then to take the long view in preparing for a race. I think another way to consider training to finish well is to think about the end goal. That is, that we are competing for the prize. We're not just competing against someone else. When we train for this race, it's another way to talk about deepening our faith and practice. We are training to become all that God has made you to be. We are not training 
to be better than someone who's running next to us. Because if you're comparing your faith life to theirs, well, like, you're looking at their pace and their stride and their strengths. That's their race. You've been given this body and these gifts. You run your way. You have endured trials they haven't had. You don't know about their body the way you know about yours. You found your talents. You know where you can speed up. You know where your endurance is. You are uniquely equipped for your faith life. And you cannot do it like the person next to you. So we have to know where we're going. That we are running for the prize. And I think for at least the runners in Paul's day would have thought about this. And Paul asks us to consider it ourselves. Be on the lookout for disqualification. Competitors know that training means absolutely nothing if you get disqualified. So we're called to be aware of our blind spots. Now that's problematic because by virtue of a blind spot, you don't know it's there. Which means you're not running someone else's race, but you are running it with others. You need people along the way who can, in love, point out the blind spots and help you get where you need to be. To protect you as you run. So that you can learn when you're drifting out of the lane or too close to the other. So that you can learn when you're tempted to cheat. It's like every scene from a race movie somebody wants to cheat. It's just a human thing. We have to learn. We need others to help us recognize when we justify or rationalize our behaviors to gain some kind of advantage. Training to finish well... I think it does require a long view. It's not about how many days you have left, but about the big arc of what God is doing in your life. And if we can consider the end goal and keep in mind that there are things that will disqualify us along the way, we will find ourselves training every day to finish well. No competitor is going to line up at the starting line in two weeks on April 28th and wake up that morning and decide to run a marathon. If you do that, you need to volunteer. Be a volunteer. They're not going to do that because they know they'll never see the last mile. Honestly, I'm not sure I would see the second one. The runners in the 2024 marathon have been training. There are, there are runners who started training over a year ago for this. There are runners who qualified, who ran last year's marathon, qualified for the Boston Marathon, will run that on, is it Monday, and then come back to Oklahoma City and run again on Sunday. They are training. They're paying attention to what they eat and how much they sleep and if those shoes are burned out. Faithful disciples did not just wake up this morning and come to the house of the Lord in their, perfect, their perfection and their glory and say, I've got it all figured out. I woke up and it was here for me this morning. I love that spirit. Come here, try that. Our life isn't automatically defined by sanctified grace. That's the work of the Lord in our life. Day by day, stride by stride. And we've been called to be fully formed by Christ. That's where we're headed. We are being called to train for the race before us so that we might finish strong, so that we can finish well, so that when we are in the last mile, that we have as much joy in that mile as we had in the first mile. That we run through the tape to victory. May you run in the pace that Jesus has set for you today. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, I know that these feet can run. And I'm not sure if we're running or not, but I pray 
that you would help us to train with you. Help us to experience the endurance that you showed us in your life, death, and resurrection. And help us, God, to finish the race with faith today. As we hear from you again about this life. It's in the name of Jesus, who is the risen Christ, that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is number 396, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Would you please stand? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to a time of pastoral prayer, I share with you just a couple first. What a blessing. Linda and Mel are here with us today. You guys have kind of been through it, so what a blessing to know that you're experiencing healing and back in worship with us this morning. In addition, I'd like to invite you to pray uh, for Marilyn Gouldy, who's going to have knee replacement surgery, but she's kind of on the waiting list, so we're praying for the, like, her to get moved up on the list. So if you will, she would really like to not be in pain anymore. So if you will join me in praying uh, for that opportunity to come sooner rather than later for Marilyn. And, and we are holding Leroy um, in prayer and the passing of his brother this week. If there are other ways that we can be in prayer with you, please let us know. We care deeply about you and, and knowing helps us be able to be with you in the midst of both joy and sorrow. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we gather in this place today confessing that we have not fully lived into the light that is Easter, the glory that is resurrection. There have been moments where we've still chosen to reside in the darkness. But you, you call out to us. You call us to yourself. When we cry out for your help, you offer healing and when we are in the worst circumstances, you stand in that with us. When we need to shout from the mountaintops of joyful things, that it has been in the darkness and that dawn is broken, you are there to hear our cries of joy. We also ask, though, God, that in our confession you would help us to be more faithful in our walk with you, that we wouldn't lose hope. We would have hope as those who have seen that your forgiveness would pour out on us, that your mercy would be ours to behold, that we would be cleansed of every sin that separates us from you, that our motivations would be changed, that our mind would be made up, that you are the Holy One and that we follow in your footsteps. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out on all who are gathered here to receive such forgiveness. That in our confession, you hear the truth, what is spoken and what is left unspoken. And that in the assurance of faith, we hear you say, son, daughter, faithful servant, in you I am so pleased. We pray for those in the world this day who are affected by violence in their homes and in their countries. For those who are affected by the violence and oppression of systems which leave people in poverty and without a meal to eat. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be Christians who seek to create integrity and dignity and respect everywhere we go and in all places, because until that's done, we don't know what it is to live in your victory. So take our mourning and turn it into dancing. And take off these ashes and clothe us with joy. Because there will come a day when all will feast at a heavenly banquet and in victory we will be united. And until that happens, we will unite ourselves and practice it and train for it every day. Even praying together with our voices, with Jesus as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers prepare to come forward um, and gather God's tithes and we share our offerings this morning, uh, I just want to tell you one of the ways that we underpin all of our ministry happened yesterday morning in this sanctuary. More than 60 people came and gathered in this place for our annual Safe Sanctuaries training. Um, we had our audio-visual folks who are here with us. The annual conference as part of our connection sent three of trainers who just went to the national conference and came here um, to lead this training for the first time in what will be a model as they travel around the state of Oklahoma leading this conference. The video that we were able to take of yesterday was because we have people who care about making sure that our equipment is in good standing. The people who came here on a Saturday morning came because they know that when they are in ministry with vulnerable adults and home communion or, or at the food pantry or when you work in our nursery or when you're holding a youth's hand when they're sitting in the lobby because they can't bring themselves to come in to hear what this is, um, that they're doing holy work. The ministry of all people in this place and so I give thanks for all of you who came who will continue to take the training by video um, we especially thank today for the connection when we give it goes to connectional ministry in lots of ways yesterday we were supported by Southern Hills United Methodist Church who sent staff by Goodrich Memorial United Methodist Church who spent staff sent staff and Kaylee community a plant church of this district who sent staff so that our children could be watched by background check and safe sanctuary trained people. Thank you for your generosity, both of spirit and gift. Um, it makes a difference in the world in this place and beyond. Let us pray. Lord, we return these tithes to you and share our offerings beyond that, that your ministry to our lives would become something through our lives to others. <coughs> We offer you ourselves in praise and thanksgiving because your kingdom is working in this place. And we want to be part of something extraordinary. Receive these gifts in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
discipleship this morning is number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Will you please sing with me? Um, so please contact him to let him know you'd like to help this week. In addition to that, I'd like to invite you to join us today at 2 p.m. in the Christian Living Center for the baby shower for the White family. I know. Neil's wife is having a baby in like 10 days. Yeah. So please join us. Please come and join celebrating Neil and his family. And, and finally, um, it is the last day to register for summer camp and get the discount. So if you see someone between the ages of I'm about to go to first grade and graduating high school, tell them to register for camp today, please, because there is a, there is a discount if we get it done by now. In addition to that, I want you to know that on Friday, April the 19th, that we're going to open the sanctuary. And if you'd like to come here and be in prayer, um, we'll open about, I don't know, 830 and be here until about 915. You're invited to come and pray. And just be here in remembrance of a day that marks all of our shared history in Oklahoma. 
Um, and also, I'd like to invite you to join us for the Passing the Torch event as part of this three-week sermon series. We are joining with other churches um, in a Passing the Torch event. So it's the same event in three places. Here we'll be hosting Saturday the 27th from 9 a.m. to noon. You'll register and pay a registration fee. It'll pay for um, part of the meal that you'll have that day, but also what's it's called a next of kin box. You will receive a set of resources that help you plan. And I know that like if you are my age, 43, you think this is for our folks who are retiring. This is for all of you. If you are a young adult, if you are um, a middle-aged adult, if you are a senior adult, this is an opportunity to think through the last mile before the finish line, and to do so with dignity. The annual conference has given us some resources, but the Oklahoma Methodist Foundation will be here. And if you can't come on the 27th, you can register to go um, to Yukon or Shawnee. It's the same event. So you just need to let the church know you're going to their event instead of coming to this one. We may have folks from those churches as well. Um, so I hope you will put that on your calendar. It's two weeks from yesterday. Um, as I send you forth, I'd like to pray a blessing over you and then ask you to receive uh, the postlude as part of that blessing. Lord God, I pray you would pour your Holy Spirit out on all who have gathered here to worship you, to love you, to come with questions, to come out of curiosity for whatever purpose they are gathered, that you gathered them to yourself. And may your spirit well up in them and then find themselves following in the footsteps of Jesus. May you help us stay on pace with you and, and be so bold, God. Be so bold as to run a race with you through the finish line. Empower us for this gift in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> out to lunch because it's Lacey's last day, but we're all wearing black. Janice asked us to all wear black, so you can do that. <laughs>